Good afternoon. I'm Michelle Easton, president of the Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute, and I want to welcome you all to our Conservative Women's Network for April. Thank you for being with us today. Special thanks to our partner, the Heritage Foundation, for co-hosting CWN with us, Bridget Wagner. Every month we talk about who could be the best person to inspire you, and uh, we sure got a good one this month. We're delighted to have Congressman Diane Black with us today, who represents Tennessee's 6th Congressional District. She's been a nurse for over 40 years, a small business owner, and former educator, and she brings a unique perspective to Congress. Elected in 2010, she's already a stalwart conservative leader in the House, fighting for fiscal responsibility, life, and liberty. Today, she'll be talking about some of the important issues facing the 113th Congress. Now, after arriving on Capitol Hill, Representative Black was chosen as one of only two freshmen to serve on the powerful House Ways and Means Committee and has been a part of the committee's efforts to fundamentally reform our nation's tax system for the first time in over 20 years. She's been at the center of many of the healthcare debates within the committee. From her work in the healthcare field, she knows firsthand the importance of high quality care and the obstacles faced by both patients and providers. She began her career as an emergency room nurse, but also served as a long-term care nurse and worked as part of an outpatient surgery team. In November of 2011, she was one of the first House freshmen to see one of her bills signed into law, legislation that closed a loophole in the President's health care law and saved $13 billion. She's also a member of the House Budget Committee and a strong supporter of the Path to Prosperity 2010 budget, which saves Medicare for future generations and puts our federal budgets on a path to balance. Building off her work in, ten in the Tennessee legislature as a pro-life leader, she's also consistently fought for the rights of the unborn. She and her husband of 30 years, over 30 years, Dr. David Black, have three grown children and six grandchildren. She told me her favorite hobby is her grandchildren. <laughs> they live in Gallatin, uh, and uh, she also likes to bird watch, and she loves to garden and dig in the dirt. Please join me now in welcoming Congressman Diane Black. Thank you so much. <laughs> if only I could find every year $13 billion to save, wouldn't we be in great shape? Unfortunately, that just doesn't happen very frequently, but it was certainly a good find. Uh, it's great to be here with you today. It's great to be with a group of conservative women um, who believe in limited government and uh, freedom being the key to the prosperity of our nation. And so it's so wonderful to be here with you today. Um, I believe that we do owe it to our children and for me, our grandchildren to balance our budget and to also preserve the American dream for future generations. It is why I ran um, for public office to begin with. It is why I fight every single day that I'm here in Congress to restore not only our fiscal policies, but also to preserve our nation's founding principles, which we seem to be losing day by day by day. Uh, I know all of you are aware that this week we lost a great lady. Um, one of the greatest leaders and one of the greatest conservative women that this world has ever known, Margaret Thatcher. Um, she is and was and always will be one of my role models. And uh, I know that uh, many of you in here today feel the same way because of what she represented during her years of service to her country. Um, she had that unwavering commitment to conservative principles and a passion for public service. And if you have seen the film, which I don't think really does her great justice, um, you can see in there that one thing they do is they show that she had a passion for what she wanted to do for her country. Uh, she uh, desocialized her country. It was certainly leading in that direction and she fought very hard against the labor unions and socialization of her country. Um, she also revitalized the struggle of her nation uh, for the power of the free market, which we all know is the best for our country, her country and our country and countries all around the world. Um, and she also faced the Soviet Union. 
uh, with one of our great presidents, Ronald Reagan, um, to bring down the Soviet Union. And really, when you sit back and you think about how at that time, given that time in um, the world, where a female leader would have led with such strong commitment and the kinds of things she was able to accomplish, uh, she certainly will continue to be a role model. Um, Today, you know, we could actually use more leaders like her. I see in the audience young faces, and I have every confidence that we will see your faces at some point in time leading in those conservative principles as she has done. Um, she's going to leave a legacy with her life, and um, she'll continue to inspire uh, all of us for the future generations uh, and those around the world, not just here in the United States, but I know that she has been seen around the world as I have traveled. I've had women say to me, wow, wasn't she such a powerful, great conservative leader? Now, yesterday, you all know that the president gave us his budget. Um, it happened to be two months late, and it happens that it's several trillion dollars short of balancing uh, over its term. And despite the rhetoric that the president has said about a balanced approach, uh, he put forward a budget that never, ever balances. His budget includes more than $1 trillion in higher taxes, nearly a trillion dollars in new spending, and $8.2 trillion in more debt for our current and future generations. Um, one good thing is the president does acknowledge in his budget that there needs to be some changes to entitlement programs. Now, that is the one positive that I do see in his budget, although the modest cuts um, of just doing things around the edges are really no substitute for structural reform. And structural reform is needed for us really to change uh, the complexion of those programs such as Medicare and um, Medicaid that will allow them to be solvent for current and also future generations. Um, his so-called proposed entitlement savings, the savings, really focus on rationing care and uh, limiting the access to quality health care. And we all know that that is done in the IPAB, which we're trying currently. There are bills out there, which I'm a sponsor of, to repeal the IPAB, where you have 30 unelected bureaucrats that will be making decisions for our seniors about what care they can and cannot get. That is not quality care. That is not the way that we need to find savings in our health care system. Now, our budget um, offers a real uh, substantial reform to Medicare and Medicaid that would ensure a long-term solvency of these important programs. Uh, we in our program recognize that we need to have future recipients to be a partner in saving these programs, and so we have what we call premium support. I just came from the Budget Committee where uh, Mr. Zeitz from OMB was testifying in front of the Budget Committee, and he called our program a voucher program. Um, I did have to call him on it. I will say that my blood pressure did rise a little bit. You may see in the clips that will be out there that I pressed him to give a definition of a voucher program. And he did define a voucher program just as it is where you give someone money, they then go into the marketplace on their own and find a, a, an insurance program that will cover them. Let's oppose, uh, talk about what a premium support program is, which is what we're talking about. A premium support program is where it is a guaranteed insurance program for our seniors, that they then will pay a premium, much like employer programs where an employer pays uh, a, a certain amount and then the employee, the recipient, uh, pays a premium. Those premiums will be adjusted according to your income, for those who are the sickest and those who have the lowest income, the federal government will pay all of their premium or most of their premium. For those who have the ability to pay more, they will pay more, but it will be a program that is put out into the marketplace and allows competition in the marketplace. In addition to that, 
it gives an opportunity for individuals to make a choice. And we all like choices. Why would we not give seniors choices about what they think is best for them? So they can choose a simple, decent program that is less costly. They can choose a quality catalog program, which would be more cost, uh, would cause more costs, which would mean that maybe their premiums would rise. But the difference is, is that it is patient-centered and market-based. It is also a guaranteed program where no one can be turned away, as opposed to a voucher program where someone just gets money and has to find a program that is going to be able to meet their needs. And we all know when you have an individual going into the marketplace, um, it's much more difficult to find insurance coverage. So I did call him on that. Um, he was not very happy about me, but I think we need to set the record straight because the other side continues to try to, um, to, to tear our program down by calling it something that it obviously is not. Um, ultimately, the president's budget doubles down on some failed policies that we know do not work. They undermine our economic recovery. Uh, we know that for the last four years, we have had unprecedented unemployment rates of at hovering around 8%, depending upon where you are in the nation. Some of my counties actually have uh, unemployment rates that are in double digit, one up to 18%. These policies continue to keep us in this failed economic um, recovery. Um, they also repress uh, upward mobility, which we believe that everyone should have the ability to be able to move up. Now, in contrast, our House Republican budget does balance. That's a novel approach, isn't it? Um, it does promote economic growth. It funds our nation's priorities, and it repairs our social safety net. It saves those very important entitlement programs that so many people depend upon, and that is Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Now, it puts forward um, a framework also for comprehensive pro-growth tax reform. As has been said, our tax code has not been reformed in over 25 years now. Uh, Ronald Reagan um, worked with Tip O'Neill at that point in time back in 1986 to reform the tax code. We want something that is fairer, flatter, and simpler, that brings down the rates. It, it, it stimulates the economy by having more money in the marketplace, which means more jobs are created. When more jobs are created, what do um, uh, more employers need? More people working. More people working means more money in pockets. More money in pockets means more goods and services being purchased. And that means that the economy then becomes vibrant and grows. And so we are committed uh, to this year, as a matter of fact, you may have heard Chairman Camp talk about, uh, despite the fact that there are others in leadership that says we're not gonna move forward on tax reform, uh, our chairman is adamant about that and our Ways and Means Committee is working very hard on bringing about a plan that will probably come out sometime in September or October of this year. Um, let me see what else I want to say to you here. Um, the president needs to start taking the responsibility seriously of balancing our budget. We need to find that common ground. I had a reporter ask me as I came out of the budget committee, um, what do you see now that the president has put his budget out, now that the Senate has their budget and we have our budget? And I told them I want to do what our founding fathers said we should do, and that is follow regular order where the House does a budget, the Senate does a budget, the President's done his budget, and now we need to have a conference committee. First of all, the budgets need to go to each of those bodies, and they need to vote on those budgets, and as a result of that, which we probably could pretty much assuredly say that neither the Senate is going to receive our budget and pass it, nor are we going to receive the Senate's budget and pass it. And we then take those budgets and we go into a conference committee and we come out with something that can move our nation forward in more prosperity. Um, you know, we cannot wait. We, this country cannot wait on future generations to balance budgets so that we can create jobs and stop this crushing burden of debt by the massive deficits that we continue to have here in our federal government.
<clears throat> excuse me. Now, let me shift gears a little bit and talk about a couple of key issues that I'm working on in addition to the budget and the tax policy. Um, earlier this year, uh, at the start of our new Congress, a uh, former representative who is now the, the um, governor of Indiana, uh, Mike Pence, and you, I know all, remember him with fondness because he had a piece of, uh, of legislation that I was very proud to pick up from him, and it is the Title X uh, Provider the, the Title X Abortion Provider Prohibition Act. It's always a mouthful. I don't know why we name these things like that. But essentially what this bill would do is it would ensure that no federal funds are given to Planned Parenthood or any other organization that abuses the privileges of the health care providers and fails to protect life. And I'm very, very happy to be able to carry this piece of legislation. I'm honored to take this over from Mike Pence. Um, like many of you know, the purpose of Title X funding of these grants is to strengthen families. And I encourage you to go to HHS's website. Um, just Google Title X dollars, and you will come up with HHS's we website that says that these dollars are to go to strengthen families. Does anyone suggest that abortions strengthen families? I think not. Um, by its own annual report, Planned Parenthood has performed more abortions in this last year than ever before, over 300,000 abortions. And yet, our Title X dollars are going to an organization that's primary um, mission is abortions. Now, it's time for conservatives and pro-life Americans to stand up and say, not on our watch and that's what this bill does today this bill has over 170 co-sponsors um, i'm very proud that it is bipartisan we actually do have some of my fellow colleagues on the other side of the aisle who have co-sponsored this bill and is proof that this fight can be won and we will continue to work and fight until it is won now, on another issue, another critical issue that I know that you all know about and you've heard about, I am continuing to work with um, the, the protecting our fundamental rights of freedom of religion. Now, as Thomas Jefferson once said, no provision in our Constitution ought to be dearer to man than that which protects the rights of conscience against the enterprises of civil authority. Under that employer mandate in the Patient Affordability Act that we commonly call Obamacare, the federal government has trampled on our religious rights. And they have told um, both individuals, both private individuals, hospitals, nonprofits, businesses, churches, and universities that they must make a choice. And the choice is, um, between defying your religious beliefs and convictions or breaking the law and paying devastating penalties to the federal government. This is wrong. Um, to infringe upon our religious freedoms, I have introduced a bill to take care of this. It's called the Health Care Conscience Rights Act. And my conscience rights bill protects those First Amendment rights of all Americans, not just some, but all Americans, to stop the Obama administration from assaulting our religious freedom by offering a full exemption, not as he has done, just partial to say, oh, if you believe only this group of people are going to be recognized in their deeply held religious beliefs. No, this is for all people, all a uh, full exemption from the Obama administration's HHS mandate and the conscience protections for individuals and healthcare entities that refuse to either provide pay for or refer patients to abortion providers, and this is to hold strong our deeply held religious beliefs. You know, we really are at a crossroads in our nation's history. And um, as someone who is 62 years old and looking at those six grandchildren, my children often say, what are we, dog meat now that you have <laughs> grandchildren? But as I look into their little faces, I realize that so much of what we have held so dear in this nation is being taken away from us. 
we are truly at a crossroads, which is why I love seeing these young faces here in the audience. Because I know that you're going to someday be the person to follow me when I'm no longer um, able or passionate or maybe even willing, maybe I get to that point where I want to hand this over to you because you believe that we have got to turn our nation around. From record deficits to high unemployment to infringements on our constitutional rights, it's critical, and I mean that sincerely, it is critical that conservatives are holding the line and offering positive alternatives to the president's failed policies. As conservatives, we believe that the American people deserve better than our high unemployment, our record debt, and our government infringement on our constitutional rights. Conservatism offers the American people positive solutions, freedom, empowerment, and greater opportunities for better life. Our principles and solutions not only will stand the test of time and math, but they're rooted in the principles that made our country the greatest nation on earth. And I have often said in those presentations that I do around uh, my district that there is a reason why we're called the American dream. Think of any other country that can talk about a dream of their country. We don't have a French dream. We don't have an Italian dream. We don't have an Australian dream. We have an American dream because we are a special nation, a special nation that was built about upon founding principles that we hold near and dear that will maintain the American dream. So with that in mind, I hope that you will leave Heritage today feeling encouraged and emboldened to continue the fight for conservatism. And as Margaret Thatcher famously said, and I try to remember this every day as we fight and we're not always totally successful, that you may have to fight a battle more than once to win it. We might have to fight a battle more than once to win it. Let's remember that because sometimes we get discouraged and we think we didn't get the whole enchilada and we're going to give up. No, we may have to fight a battle more than once to win it. Well, thank you, and um, I guess I can open it up to questions now. Is thank that okay? Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. If you would uh, give your name and your affiliation, if you have one, thank you so much. Oh, you you're are so truly welcome. an inspiration. Oh, thank you. You are. Uh, questions? Raise your hand. Here you go. How are you doing? Hello. Wait for the mic. Thank you. Hello, Vincy Ancom C, the American Conservative Union. Thank you for joining us oh, today. You're and it was a pleasure to also have you at CPAC. Oh, last it was month. great. <laughs> it was really great. My question for you is how do you think the dynamic of women in Congress will change as we cycle into new elections? Just because we've been very lucky to be able to have more women step up into that role. And I think that with seeing the legacy of um, Prime Minister Thatcher, then we will hopefully be able to see more women want to play that leadership role. Oh, thank you so much for that question. That is so important. Uh, I'm so proud of our conference, our Republican conference this year. We had three wonderful, strong women run for leadership positions, and Kathy McMorris Rogers was chosen as our conference chair. Lynn Jenkins is our uh, vice chair of our conference, and then Virginia Fox is our secretary. And there was some discussion as these three women put their name on the ballot about whether or not we would be successful with having three women in those top positions and whether the males in our conference would support that. And this is really historical for us. Um, but I encouraged each one of them to go for it. I said, you know, let's not limit ourselves. Let's go for it. And I'm proud to say that our colleagues, and this is a position that is voted on by the entire conference, that our colleagues, both male and female, saw fit to put females that are good, thinking, strong, conservative women in those leadership positions. <laughs> I think what that does for us as conservative women is to say, as we are going around the country and trying to recruit people um, to come and be a part, that that is one of the things I have 
asked to be a part of is to help to tell our story about what we're doing in our conference to support women and to include women into the conference more and more. Um, you know, I am not a feminist. I will tell you that. My husband will tell you that I still like to have the door open for me. He doesn't always do that. But when I'm dressed nicely, I think it's just nice for him to open the door. And um, I love it when I'm walking down the sidewalk with some of my male colleagues or just friends, and they'll say, oh, but, you know, I should be walking next to the sidewalk in case anything happens. I like all of that. I think that's great. But I also like to be recognized for my brains and my persistence. And um, that's something that I think that I can take forward as I talk to those women that we're trying to recruit because we need both the balance of both. You know, God made us different. We just are. And God made us to think a little differently than my male colleagues. And every now and then in meetings, I'll just have to I sit back quietly and listen, and then I just, you know, I had enough of the listening and I need to say something. And I'll pipe up and um, my male colleagues will look at me and go, you know, I hadn't thought about it in that way. That, that's a good suggestion. That's a good thought. And that's what we need in the balance of having both the male and the female in, um, in our conference in particular, but in Congress in general because there is a different perspective. We come at things a little differently than our male colleagues do. And so I'm hoping, and this is a very long answer to your question, um, I'm really hoping that we can help women who are in particular situations that might make it difficult for them to commit to the um, big commitment of coming to Congress. I take Martha Roby, who has a three-year-old and a six-year-old. You know, it's awfully hard to leave those little ones at home. I was sitting beside her one day when she got a call from her mom who was with her children, and George, her youngest one, had a fever. And I could hear George saying, I want my mommy. And I think, oh, my goodness, I don't know what I'd do if I were in that situation. But I honor the fact that her family, along with her, are sacrificing her to be in Congress so that she can serve. She's a strong, intelligent woman. And um, we need to tell that story to women that there is a way to make it work. We need to put them in touch with women who have those similar circumstances. And I want to encourage all of you young ladies in the audience to just continue to move forward with building your resume, um, learning all that you can so that when you come to that time that you feel that you have been called to do that, that you'll be prepared and you will be able to have that strong voice as a female to share your um, thoughts and convictions with those around you that are the male persuasion. Thank you. You're welcome. I think we have one over here. Hi, thank you so much for coming. I just wanted to um, address the point on feminism. I think that it's time that we stole that term back from the neo -Nazi, or what is it called, the feminazis and now. <laughs> yes. Because I believe the um, their traditional view of feminism would match Proverbs 31, the woman who is supportive of That's her right. husband, doesn't, isn't antagonistic of men, is, um, is a hard worker herself, supports her family, et cetera. Um, but with regards to appealing across the, um, across the aisle to women who have categorically placed themselves in the moderate or the Democratic Party. Do you have any suggestions for how we can get them to see our side and see the, the reason and the value um, in taking and supporting Republican values? I know parental, um, what is it called? Parental uh, rights has been a big issue that's actually mm -hmm. pulled people to our mm -hmm. side. Right, right. So do you have any other suggestions? Sure. I, I think that the way Oh, sorry. My name's Monique Miles, and oh. I'm a, an attorney practicing in the DC area. Oh, thank you, Monique. Congratulations. You. Great career. Um, I think that there are things that we do have in common. I mean, generally women make most of the decisions on healthcare matters in their homes and to um, come together when we're talking about healthcare needs that we have a great voice because no matter whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, um, this is something that's near and dear to our hearts because we are more nurturing. We do, um, we do a lot of that nurturing in our households, so I think that's one of the areas. Um, more and more women are, are starting their own business that are entrepreneurs. That entrepreneurial spirit, as a matter of fact, more businesses have been started in I think the last five years by women than actually have been by men. I think I'm right on that statistic, and so I'd have to go back and look and make sure five years is correct, but I know in the last at least 
past couple of years that's so. And so there is an opportunity for us to join together on helping women, helping young women who uh, or even women my age that have had an idea and they really want to do this and helping them to be able to do what they, they have as their dream and that is to start and operate a business. Uh, I happen to be a female business owner. And so I think there are things like that that we do have in common. And um, I, I will tell you, I try to reach across the aisle in those commonalities because I have not had the privilege in my years when I served at the state level, I served 12 years there, six in the House, six in the Senate. I never had the opportunity to serve in a totally Republican atmosphere. So I know how to reach across the aisle. And um, we need to do more of that. Absolutely. Um, but there will be some areas where we have deeply held beliefs that are different. And um, when we have those, we need to learn that we can stand up. Even though sometimes there is such um, anger and we feel like we want to shrink back down because we tend not to want to be confrontational. And I think that's one thing I will say is as we have these deeply held beliefs, and society wants to beat us down. And many times those groups want to be really ugly and nasty and it's, it's hard for us sometimes to stand up against that. We must do it. Uh, I remember back in the state of Tennessee, I carried a lot of pro-life legislation there. And there was a group of women that were called guerrilla women. And they were very pro-choice. I called it pro-abortion. And um, there was a hearing where I was going to be speaking and they came into the, into the meeting room in large numbers and they had uh, camouflage on. And they were really menacing looking and they started shouting things and it got to be a little out of hand. Unfortunately, we had some people to stop all of that. But, you know, if I hadn't been convicted about what I believed in, I might have backed down. And I think that's one of the things we've got to remember as women that we don't need to back down. You don't have to do it in an ugly way. Um, we can do it with a smile on our face. But being able to stand up and have the strength and the courage to do that when you might be getting beat down is so important. I think we have one back here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I have a question. When the, when the uh, employment figures came out, it was reported that as many people who joined the workforce also joined the disability, the social security disability roles. Then when Rand Paul, I believe it was Rand Paul, was speaking at Howard University, uh, one of the students came out and said how much he wanted the government to be able to take care of him. I want to know, first of all, is there anything Congress is doing to examine why we've had such massive increases in social security disability enrollment and also, what can we do to encourage people to stop buying into this helpless and hopeless learned dependent society that the Obama administration is trying to create? Oh, I'm sorry, my name is Donna and I'm nobody. <laughs> oh, oh, Donna, I disagree with that. I am sure you have touched a lot of people's lives. I, I am sure you have. And as a teacher, you touched a whole, whole lot of people's lives, but in a very special way. Um, okay, so Social Security Disability, um, we don't talk a lot about the fund. And we talk a lot about what's going to happen in 10 years with Medicare um, Trust Fund. In 10 years, if nothing is done structurally, it will be defunct. That means nothing left for those that are currently in it. And for you future generations, you will have paid into it and got zero. So we talk a lot about that. We talk about Social Security Trust Fund. Um, it has a little longer in sustainability before it actually goes um, bankrupt. And there are some things we can do to not be real painful to keep that um, solvent. But what we don't talk about is the Social Security Disability um, uh, Fund. And that fund actually goes defunct in 2016. So here we are in 2013. Social Security Disability Trust Fund will um, go, 
not uh, disability trust fund will go defunct in, in three years. So I started looking at this last year when I was on the um, subcommittee for human resources, and this was brought up in one of our hearings, and it just really intrigued me, so I started looking more deeply into it. Senator Coburn has done a lot of good research into the topic. Um, the Social Security Disability um, subcommittee this year is looking into this and although I'm not on that committee they have allowed me to sit in on the committee and to be a participant because I learned so much last year. Look, the safety net is so important for those who truly need it and I have worked with dis the, the disability um, arena for a long time during my years back in Tennessee. And if we don't do something about it, for those who really need it, there will be nothing. We know that there are a lot of people that are on Social Security Disability right now who should not be there. As a matter of fact, a real short, cute, um, true story is that Senator Coburn, who lives in Oklahoma, there had been a storm. And he had some trees that had fallen on his property. And so he contracted with somebody, an independent um, person, to come and clean up the brush. And during that time, the guy was in the trees, trimming down the trees and so on, and afterwards he came to the door, and he um, was to be paid, and Senator Coburn made out a check and handed it to him, and he said, oh, I can't take a check. And he says, well, why not? He said, well, I'm on Social Security Disability, and that would impact my Social Security Disability. Now, he had no idea that he was talking to a senator. And this just... I guess set the senator's hair on fire, and he began looking into what was going on with Social Security Disability Insurance. Um, from that, we know that there are a number of things that need to be done, and there, without going into detail, and I'd be happy if anybody wants to talk to me offline about that, but um, there, there are a number of things that have to be done. But you make such a good um, point about when we do that, when we put people on Social Security Disability that shouldn't be on it, we really are changing their lives in a way that I think is immoral. Because I'm a true believer that God wants us to be all we can be. And when the government is complicit in saying to someone, here, have this, we don't care about whether you are everything that you're meant to be. Um, there are still things that some people can do. We know in certain parts of the country there's more disability that is given out by the judges than in others. There's a real disparity in, in from one geographic area to the other. The administrative law judges don't have really good guidelines. It's very subjective, and there are a number of things that can be done where we need to pare that down, get people back to work um, so that they can have dignity. What's the second thing people ask you after they ask your name? What do you do? What do you do? And we're all proud of what we do. If you're being productive, you're proud of that. And I think it's a shame when the government is complicit in allowing somebody to not be all they can be. So thank you for that question. It's a very big issue, and you're going to be hearing a lot more about it. Anybody hear the NPR piece? Oh, you got to Google it. There, you never would expect this from NPR, but there is a young reporter who did an, a very um, in detailed investigation on the whole Social Security Disability Insurance Program, and she there's an hour worth of recording about her results and what she found. And if you Google that, just go NPR Disability um, Insurance. It's, it's worth listening to. It is very, very worth listening to. And obviously there's something that needs to be done and we are working on it. I have a question. I, I know um, you have a background as a nurse and your mm -hmm. husband's a doctor mm -hmm. um, and you uh, <clears throat> introduced the conscience protection law. We thank you for that. Um, I'm wondering how your background and your husband's background has shaped your view of the fight over Obamacare and what kind of um, leadership role your colleagues and kind of look to you to play with that background mm -hmm. in healthcare. Well, I am blessed because of my healthcare background that I have an opportunity in many areas. And um, Paul Ryan, who is just a wonderful, wonderful man, very smart, um, has really blessed me with giving me the opportunity to be involved in many of those conversations. Um, my husband is a PhD, and so he's not an MD doctor. We always say he's not a real doctor. 
it's just funny. Yeah, this is being recorded, so I probably should take that back. But he's a brilliant man. <clears throat> but he has his PhD in forensic medicine. So, um, but but more than that, um, the whole Obamacare situation with the exchange programs and insurance, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is impacting the business as much as anything. And. I hear this consistently. I have 19 counties in my district. Uh, I visit them as much as I possibly can when I get back home, and I always do industry visits. And this is the question I ask everybody. What's keeping you up at night? And without a doubt, the number one thing that is keeping them up is the Obamacare. And what do they do about uh, figuring out whether they're going to keep the insurance or not? Now, here's the problem. If they say, no, we're not going to keep the insurance, we've already decided we'd rather pay the penalty because it's just too cumbersome to have this uh, amount of money keep going up, the rules and regulations change, there's so much uncertainty, we can't figure it into our budget, we're just going to pay it. Now you put somebody back out into the marketplace where they're on their own to find the insurance. If they don't fit into one of those exchanges for the subsidies, the cost of their insurance is so high that they can't find an individual um, policy. Now, if they decide, well, it's cost too much, I can't find an individual policy that fits into my income level, they're without insurance. And we expect, the studies say, 20 million Americans will lose their employer-sponsored insurance at the end of this year as a result of this. Now, here we go. What do we have? We have people that don't have insurance that had insurance before, and guess what they're going to have to pay? a penalty because they don't have insurance. When they do their IRS and they ask on the IRS form, do you have insurance? They have to say no. So they will actually be paying a penalty and no insurance because of what's being pushed upon them by this Obamacare. And unfortunately, when the president said, if you like what you have, you can keep it, that is not true. Because if those policies don't meet certain standards, then that employer either has to decide to raise it to those standards or they get rid of it. And it is going to be a mess. I come from the state of Tennessee. We had the um, pilot project for a single payer system. It's called TenCare. It was breaking the bank in our state. We actually dissolved it and it no longer is there. We're back to the Medicaid only program. And look, we lived this nightmare. It was an absolute nightmare. It's what really brought me into public office as a nurse. And um, I just see visions of what we went through in Tennessee. I see that happening in the nation and I'm so concerned. I'm concerned for the quality of care. I'm concerned for the ac uh, access of care and the cost of care. Those were the three things the Patient Affordability Act was supposed to address. More access, greater quality, lower cost. We know now it's going to add $6.2 trillion to the life of the health care bill onto our debt. So it's not done any three of those things, and it's going to really cause havoc. It's going to wreak havoc in our health care system. If I could maybe ask the last question. Yes, you know, I could be here all day talking know, about this. I know, we'll get you yes. up by one. Yes, um, thank you. And then we can maybe talk informally. Uh, you know, at the Claire Booth Lewis Policy Institute, we focus on young women, mostly uh, college-age women, and there's a number of them here, uh, interns and, and otherwise. And uh, when I came to Washington in 1973, I was an intern right out of college, and we got Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. um, anytime, anyplace, anywhere, abortions are fined. And we have found among the women we work with and some of the young men that the attitude of any time, anywhere, anyplace has really changed. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the thing was, always, oh, we have to win people's hearts. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we're winning their hearts. We're making great progress in that area. And yet there's still a million abortions mm -hmm. every year. Mm -hmm. These predictions are always tough to do. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you see mm -hmm. uh, coming in the future? Because we're winning the hearts, especially among the young people, young men and women. But we're still doing a million a year, and we're funding, federally funding some right. of these. Right. What's, what's going to happen? Okay, so let's just go back to that time um, in technology when that decision was made. You'll remember the greatest argument was, when does life begin? And for so many years, women were told, this is just a blob. It's really not a person. It's just a blob that's there. It's a blob of cells. 
Well, we now know <clears throat> that it's not a blob of cells, that as soon as the egg and the sperm meet, it's actually the beginning of life. And if left alone, it will then result in a life. We know now something far different than what we knew back then. Um, we also talked about when was life sustainable outside of the womb. You know, back then, if, a, if a, a, a baby was born a month prematurely, we had a heck of a time saving that child because their lungs were not completely developed. We didn't have the, the knowledge or the technology to keep them alive. We are now saving babies down to 25 weeks. Nobody ever thought that could be. So when does life begin? When is life sustainable outside of the womb? You know, the more technology, the more we know, the, the, who knows what will be in 20 years. Um, it's so interesting. But I think the more we know and the more access that we give to this kind of technology to help young women make that decision, the more we will win their hearts. Now we're doing ultrasounds. I'm gonna reach down into my purse and I'm gonna get something that I carry with me. This is nursing me, you know. I, I can't ever not be a nurse. I, as a matter of fact, I see people um, sometimes and I say, what is that little spot on your face? Have you gotten that taken care of? My husband says, that's none of your business. But you can't help it. Once you're, you're in medicine, you can't help it. So I carry this around with me when I um, have an opportunity to be able to talk to women about babies and fetal development. And here's what I carry with me. This is 11 weeks. This is 11 weeks. This is actually what they look like in 11 weeks. They have little eyelids. Their hands are completely formed. We didn't know this back in 1973. And the more we allow um, the woman who's making that decision to have all of the information that she can have, the better decision she will make for herself and for the future of what she holds in her hand. And that's how we make the difference. With good information, because look, young people want information and they want good information. They don't want us to lie to them. They don't want us to uh, put something in their heads that's just what we want them to hear. That's why this is so important for me, is to say, I'm not just saying this because I'm an old lady with six grandchildren and who believe strongly in what is said in the Bible, because I come from a Christian perspective that um, you know God knew, knew us before he even put us in the womb. But that may not be somebody else's perspective. Um, but here you can't deny, you cannot deny what I hold in my hand. And uh, sometimes I just give it to them because, and I, I look, I go around to the um, crisis pregnancy centers and I try to meet with women, young girls that are in there, and just talk to them and just let them talk about what's in their heart and why they're making that decision and to help them to make the best decision that they can live with for their lives because we know what happens when they make a decision where they weren't truly informed, and later what they live with is just, it's unconscionable that we put a young woman in that situation. So thank you for that last question and allowing me to share my passion. <laughs> we have some gifts for you here. Oh! <laughs> what a, you truly are an inspiration. Thank you so much for oh, serving in Congress and representing so our welcome. views. It's my honor. We have a couple of special ah! gifts. This is our limited edition Claire Booth Loose Policy Institute coffee mug with a famous saying of Claire Booth Loose. What is it? No good. No deed. good no deed goes on punish. I use this. There you go. <laughs> and this is our. I had mentioned this to you earlier. Our Great American Conservative Women yeah. calendar. We finished our 2014. We've just done our last photo shoot. But I think if you would be willing, we would like to put you in oh. our 2015. But anyway, there's this well, year's. I'd be honored. And then, oh my goodness, a tote bag for all of her gifts. There you yeah. go. Well, thank you very thank much. You. And because we're a 
Think Tank, we like to give away books. So um, for from one leader, uh, from one leader to another, this is Ed Fulner's. Um, oh, the biography yes. of Ed Fulner, the oh, immediate past president man. of the Heritage Foundation, mm -hmm. leading the way. We so appreciate all that you do to lead oh. the way for so many young women and also in our Congress. So thank you for joining us today. You're we very really welcome. appreciate all thank the leadership you, you provided oh, for us. Oh gosh, this is so fun to have a goodie bag. <laughs> thank and, you very much. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you. We'll have lunch just outside. Thanks.